My name is Dan Lubin. I'm a research physicist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. And most recently I've been working on uh, solar variability and climate. In particular, I'm focusing on, on the Maunder Minimum. The Maunder Minimum was a period in the uh, second half of the 17th century and the early 18th century where the climate changed. It cooled in, in the northern hemisphere considerably. And that is the one uh, major climate change that we can uh, attribute mainly to solar forcing, to changes in the solar output. And um, reconstructing this irradiance decrease is uh, it's challenging. There are various proxy uh, data you can use. You can some people reconstruct the uh, the darkest and, and brightest parts of the solar surface during and and then uh, try to correlate that with um, with proxy data such as beryllium ten isotopes. Other people there's there are various ways you can try to reconstruct how much the solar irradiance had decreased relative to the present during the modern minimum. The numbers come up between one and three watts per square meter compared with the present. And that is a smaller number than what we're, uh, what we're doing to our atmosphere with increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. So that should kind of give you the answer right there as to how important this is. But yet it is important.
And so there are two, uh, two research questions that, uh, that this brings up. The first is that uh, what happens if the modern minimum were to occur later this century? Uh, over the past century, the sun has been relatively high in its output and also very quiet. Um, and that may change. Some of the analysis of the time series of solar variability over the past several centuries suggests that we may be due for, for another grand minimum event. Maybe not as big as the modern minimum, but maybe as big. And so the question is, if it were to occur later this century in a climate warming scenario, what would be the change in climate? Would it offset global warming due to greenhouse gases? And uh, I have done some climate modeling work on that. And the short answer is no. There would be a slight cooling if the sun were to go into another modern minimum event, uh, probably two to three tenths of a degree. But that would not offset the climate warming that occurs due to the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, even in the most optimistic scenario of greenhouse gas controls, a modern minimum would not offset that. We have a slightly smaller decrease in the overall global average temperature, um, but it's not going to, the Amander minimum in the future is not going to offset a climate, the climate warming due to greenhouse gases. Uh, the change will be very small. Uh, but we do see a regional shifts with more warming in, in Greenland, Central Asia, and East Asia that are actually enhanced in this, in this Amander minimum, minimum, minimum under the future uh, greenhouse warming scenario. And, um, so it's just a, it's kind of an altered state of the atmosphere. We don't offset the global warming, but we have regional climate changes that are interesting in their own right. And so I think it's, it's an interesting thing to study and, and contemplate both from the astrophysical side and the geophysical side. Um, it's not, a modern minimum in the future is not going to be completely innocuous. There will be regional changes we, we need to predict better uh, or need to, to project better. Um, but it, but uh, if the sun goes dim like that, like it did back in the 17th century, it's not going to get us out of the global warming. Um, issue that we've cr been created. So um, going a little bit, uh, now I'm kind of towards, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well with time. The, um, this, this whole climate denial, the cl climate change denial movement, I'll just kind of summarize, you can summarize in one, one view graph what they do. Uh, their objective is to com basically con convince the public that the science is still uncertain. It's a very low bar in terms of rhetoric. Uh, they just want people to believe that it's all, the, the science haven't figured out yet, so this don't worry about it. And if nobody worries about it, nothing will ever get done. Um, these are think tank organizations that really, they essentially do no scientific research. Uh, there are some very few exceptions that prove that rule. Uh, they prove the rule by the fact that whenever they get a paper somehow into a journal, those papers are immediately refuted. Um, they don't do real scientific research, but they do imitate scientific reporting and scientific culture with all kinds of fake publications and fake conferences. Um, it's, it's really quite pathetic. They do have insider access to some leading conservative media, like Fox News and Wall Street Journal. I mean, they, they can publish there and then broadcast there as much as they want, pretty much. Their modus operandi is basically just to search through the entire genuine scientific peer-reviewed literature for work that they can make to appear to be flawed. Um, they then will misrepresent this work using any number of abuses of, of logic and uh, abuses of scientific language. Uh, so so all, all of their, their argument is, is basically flawed and, or, or, or deliberately uh, some form of misrepresentation. But what they do is they're, they're very clever writers. And they'll write, these oper they're very con they'll write all kinds of blogs and op-ed pieces. And, and they just, they're very good at using language that pushes people's buttons. They'll dress this stuff up, you know, stuff up with language of Adam Smith, mother and country, baseball and apple pie. And, um, and, the, and the, whole, the whole point is just to push people's buttons, make people think that the, uh, the science is still uncertain. It's a, couple, it's a few examples of the, the common logical fallacies I've seen over the years. Um, the first one, they'll always frame the problem as a, as a false alternative. Either our climate variability is natural or it's man-made. Um, you know, if a graduate student worked, you know, walked into my office with that kind of uh, hypothesis, I'd throw them out. You know, well, why can't there be contributions from both? Um, there's false alternatives all over climate, climate change denial is not only the scientific statement, but uh, you may have heard of this, this thing called the skeptical environmentalist by a guy named Bjorn Longberg. Longberg. It's another false alternative. He basically says, his essence, the essence of his argument is he, either, either we, uh, we worry about climate change or we worry about you know, poverty and world hunger and so forth. So it's another false alternative. And generally speaking, in, in rhetoric, when people want to convince you, to try to make you do nothing, to, to create inaction, they will argue in terms of false alternatives. It's a very good way to kind of make people freeze up. 
Another technique you see a lot is what's called a blizzard, just proof by, ver by verbosity. These people will just come up with one argument, one statement after another, after another, after another, each one of which is stupid and refuted a long time ago, but there are so many of them coming at once that you think maybe some, some of them must be right. And that's, that is just, just uh, one way to kind of blindside you into, uh, into maybe thinking the thing isn't all that, all that certain. Then there's a, what's called the nirvana fallacy, what some people have called, they demanded sound science. They want the, the models to be perfect and our understanding to be 100% perfect before we do, uh, before we even consider doing anything. You know, so that's the nirvana fallacy. Cherry picking, I mean, so much of climate science is time series analysis. So you, you know, the old, um, the old saw, oh, there's a cold winter, therefore global warming isn't happening. That's the you know, most common example of cherry picking, but they, they do it all the time. They'll, they'll go to some time series, and, time series and pick a point that happened to be during the El Nino in 1997 when it was warm, and they'll say, uh, oh, see, the trend is down and instead, of, instead of up. They do it all the time. Um, another sort of related fallacy, reductio ad unum opus is what I call it. They will look for some paper that has something that, to any technical reader looks like it might be uncertain and then they will hold this paper up as the linchpin of climate science and then they will attack that and throw stones at it. Um, the most famous example is the, the man hockey stick papers where you had um, the temperature trends um, sort of level and then in the 20th century going up but the error bars on the, the data that uh, preceded the physical temperature record and used proxies were much larger. So any technical reader is going to say, oh, the error bars are larger in the previous part of the time series. Um, so maybe the statistics are flawed or maybe there's nothing to this. Uh, of course, Michael Mann did his statistics very well and the, the paper is, is quite sound. It's one of the best papers written. Uh, but they'll hold that paper up, which is entirely an observational paper and a data analysis paper. They'll hold that up as the linchpin of all climate science and they'll throw stones at it. And there have been entire Senate hearings dedicated to that. To, to that paper. It's really quite pathetic. You go to any climate science textbook, they don't start with the Michael Mann and, and uh, the hockey stick. They start with the governing equations of the climate system. Um, but so that's another technique. Uh, there's a um, something I call the gilded non sequitur involving past climate changes, um, which I'll go through in a second. Uh, and then finally I'll go to this little humorous YouTube example of just what's called false attribution, just picking something that's completely irrelevant. But first, uh, the gilded non sequitur, this you'll you hear in, in one form or another all the time. You know, climate has changed many times in the past through many natural causes and natural cycles, so we shouldn't worry about human influence on climate today. And there's even, there was even a best-selling book uh, a few years ago. Um, it was called Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years. And it, again, it was making the argument that climate has changed so much in the past. Actually, what they, this 1500-year cycle they pulled out, uh, the Dansgaard Oscar, Oscar cycle, is not even a warming. It's just a seesaw in energy between hemispheres. So they didn't even get that right. But this, this is the argument you find in one form or another. Of course, it's a ridiculous non sequitur. It's like saying that your car didn't start two years ago because the fuel pump was broken, so the reason it didn't start this morning cannot be a dead battery. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Climate has changed in the past for various natural reasons, but that doesn't mean that we're not um, influencing our atmosphere today with uh, unprecedented, unprecedented industrial activity. So, so I'll kind of uh, conclude with um, one of my big worries here. I'm not so concerned about saving the planet. You know, life will, uh, if the planet warms by 10 or 15 degrees, life on the planet will go on in some form. You know, will it? Will our advanced civilization be part of it? I don't know. But what I'm more concerned about is. Um, it's just a demagoguing of this issue. Um, you know, if climate change is so, so thoroughly grounded in data and, and classical physics, uh, it's such a solid consensus. Um, if this can be demagogued, then any scientific issue can be demagogued. It, it's gotten so bad now that climate scientists are now receiving death threats you know, on their email. And they're getting all kinds of legal harassment from you know, cowboy prosecutors who want to just grab all their emails again, you know, once again and throw them out into the world. It's, and, and, this, this is these are scientists in, in the 21st century United States of America. And what's also fri quite frightening is that all this propaganda I've talked about is um, it, it's so cheap. It's chump change for these, uh, these industry segments that are funding it. And through their, their clever, clever wordsmithing and their access to certain news sources, they're basically kept half the American public ignorant of a huge amount of research, uh, of research uh, from all of our applicable government laboratories. Um, so what I would just kind of ask for you, uh, those of you who work in different disciplines, I think it's important that understanding and ability to explain climate change is just as important now as the ability to understand and explain evolution and natural selection. 
it, it's really, I think, I would like to see the entire scientific communica community be a little bit kind of close ranks uh, around this one somewhat beleaguered branch. Um, but at the same time, if you're going to do that, I, I would give you advice to have a polite out in, in have an out in polite conversation. You know, be able to refer somebody to a good website like realclimate.org or a good book on the subject. And an excellent book is uh, um, Richard Somerville's *The Forgiving Air*. Uh, and the reason you need that out is if you ever find yourself engaging in you know a cocktail party or a ball game or something with one of these climate deniers, you will often find they don't shut up. They will just not stop talking. They will just rant and rant and rant, and you will never convince that person that he is wrong and you're right. No matter, especially if, if he realizes that you're a scientist but not a climate scientist, he'll just come right after you, and you just want to go, you know, you know, get rid of the guy. <laughs> so have, have some sort of out so you can extricate yourself from verbal abuse. Uh, but but I I, I I I would ask that you all be prepared to at least explain what climate change is, that it is a genuine consensus, that it is uh, something that's really going on. Um, 